I once heard a story from a couple who spoke of what God did in their lives. They were sent by the Lord to China as missionaries. But before that, they were living, as they would put it, maybe a nominal Christian life. A life of, as they had put it, or as the husband is, had put it, they were the last ones in the door and the first ones out. Yet they realized they weren't finding the depth of what their hearts were looking for. And so they began to search and seek. Is there more? Is there more to this life? They went to a conference while they were on their search and their journey. And the man had invited them to come down front to be prayed for. And when they came down, God did a radical change in their lives. Now, they were Christians and they professed Christ, but they realized what they were professing wasn't necessarily matching up with the depth of what the Christian life could look like. And as they were praying, God's love was poured out into their hearts. They began to change the way they lived, to follow Christ in a new way. As God called them to go to China as missionaries, they began making sacrifices. The husband was a well-to-do banker, a partner in the firm that he was at, And he quit his job. And they had a wonderful home, beautiful home, a couple car garage, green green grass, definitely greener than what we have right now. But spring is coming, don't worry, especially this week. And and so they sold. And then the wife began to take over the story and say that, you know, the sacrifices they were making did not seem hard. They seemed joyful as they sold all of their possessions and began to give up everything to follow Christ in this new calling that he had for them. And they know it was sacrifices and that people were in some ways saying, ah, we shouldn't do this, but they went. And so the hard part really came. When they got to China, the wife described how challenging it became in this new calling. She said everything was good until they got to this one room apartment where they could see rats running around. Sewer was in the streets in the place that they lived. And all of a sudden, you you see the depth of her heart begin pouring out. She said it was so challenging because as a mother of three children, three young children who just took her kids to a rat-infested, sewer-in-the-streets place. Her heart was breaking, and sacrifice all of a sudden became really hard for this new calling that they had in Christ. But that was only the beginning of their journey. Now, they literally took a huge step of faith. They went before they spoke any Chinese, so they didn't know the language, didn't know how to talk to anyone, Uh, or communicate until someone on the street who actually happened to speak Chinese and English, they developed a friendship with them. And from there began a new journey of what God called them to do in starting an orphanage in China where they brought in those that were left out, the medically challenged, the kids with no parents. They, began, they continued to speak about this experience of how God's love and presence was there in that place and how they could feel God's love as they poured love out into these children. The man weeps at the end of the story and, and just weeping about what God did in his heart when they were prayed for and the amount of love that God had for him, had for them. People of faith, I ask you now, how far would you go for Jesus? What would you sacrifice? What would you give up? Would you give up everything to grow deeper in his word? 
Would you sacrifice money? Maybe take a lower income job to free up your schedule to disciple others or maybe work with kids? Would you trade the comforts of this life knowing that it might not always be easy, but that actually it'll be harder yet more fulfilling because whatever God is calling you to, you know that when you're living in that calling and following Christ, there's so much more reward. Today, I want to talk about living life as a follower and disciple of Christ. I want us to think about the depth of being a disciple of Christ and the joy we find in Christ. And I want to look at the lives of Philip and and Nathaniel. First, their calling and their calling from the Lord to follow him. Then the three years that they had with Jesus And finally, their mission after Christ ascended. And then let's think about how this affects our lives as disciples of Christ. Now, what is a calling? I know we had touched on that a little bit last fall, but I want to bring it back up. What does it mean to be called by God? I believe this is a larger question that we ask in our own faith journey. Think of the times where maybe you have asked that question. God, what are you calling me to do? Are you calling me to do this? Or are you calling me to do that? Or maybe, what would you have me do today? The simple words that God speaks. I had a buddy tell me God told him to wear a t-shirt one day. A particular t-shirt. Okay. All right. He's not thinking it's going to be a big deal. And then at a business, it someone came up and approached him about the t-shirt he was wearing and it struck up a faith conversation with a random person that he didn't know. Kind of an interesting thing for God to say that way. But what does it mean to be called by Christ? Sometimes I think we develop the idea that only pastors or missionaries are called because that's what calling means. A certain professionalism to the word calling. In actuality, I think a more biblical definition is purely and wholly to be followers of Christ in whatever context we are in, to be Christ, to live the Christian life. In other words, we're all called to be followers of Christ and live it out, to live out our Christian faith in whatever context whether at work or at home or at school, with our family, wherever we're at, we are called to fully follow Christ and live the Christian life. In the account of John, we find this amazing story of two men, Philip and Nathaniel, and Jesus calling these two men to follow him. And I really want to unpack this story because There's so much rich meaning to their calling. Sometimes I think they get overshadowed a little bit because we focus a lot on Peter, Andrew, James, and John and their calling. Uh, Last week with the kids, uh, during Sunday school, we marched around the church singing the song. If you follow me, kids, you know the song? If you follow me. If you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. If you follow me. Sorry, I wasn't a music major. I don't sing maybe quite as well as as Denise or or all the singers this morning. But uh, I want to focus now to the fifth and sixth disciples. And in all the count, they were the next ones called. Philip was from the town of Bethsaida, which was not a really good town, actually. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, woe to you, Bethsaida, woe to you. And he lists a bunch of cities of woe to you. It will be worse for you than Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Jesus called a man from not such a good town. Actually, he called three men because 
Peter and Andrew were also from Bethsaida. Maybe they all grew up in the same synagogue together, going to the same synagogue youth group, hanging out together. And then they were fishermen. Philip was a fisherman. So he had a very, what was seen then, a simple trade, a man that would fish all night because fishing was better then. For the fishermen in, in here, you may also agree. Uh, and then and then sleep in the day. However, as we dive into Philip more, we see that he has such an amazing calling from the Lord. Jesus went to him and just said, follow me, just straight up, follow me. And so then he runs to his friend. Philip and Nathaniel were believed to be friends. And he says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And about whom the prophets also wrote about Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Jesus as or as Philip, as he's being called in Christ, he starts amazing. Over the next three, three years, we see that there's a little more skepticism in who he is as a person. In the gospel accounts, we see he was almost a little more analytical not always believing that Christ was who he said he was or believing that he was in the presence of God. He seemed to have less faith as a person, maybe a little more weak in his faith. He always needed to know the details instead of just trusting God. We see that in the story where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Philip was like, it's going to take eight months wages to feed all these people. And then... Jesus is just kind of, I got this, don't worry. So then Philip goes to his friend, Nathaniel, and says these words, we found the one that Moses spoke about in the law and the one that the prophet spoke about. Now, Nathaniel was a man who was also a fisherman. He was from Cana, which is actually where Jesus did his first miracle turning the water into wine. Nathaniel, at the beginning of his calling, we find a lot more skepticism and even prejudice because he was prejudiced against Nazareth. How could someone come from Nazareth? And that's that's what he says. Philip describes this person is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. A little more backdrop, backdrop, we find these two disciples as people who are more well versed in scripture they know the prophecies they're anticipating christ coming and they're they're under roman rule and oppression and so they know that now has to be the time it has to be when christ is going to come and set us free so nathaniel and philip are looking for the messiah so nathaniel being well versed in the prophecies says, how could someone come from Nazareth? I mean, he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. He's supposed to be the line of David. He knows the prophecies, and so that's what he's looking for. But out of trust, he decides, all right, my buddy says this is the guy. I'll go check it out. And then when he gets there, Jesus says, here is a true Israelite where nothing is false. See, Jesus goes right to his heart. He says, I saw you under the fig tree, and I know who you are. Not just that I saw you, but I see your heart, that you're a real Israelite. A real Israelite was not someone who just memorized the laws and knew the laws, but it was someone who lived the law, someone who had a good character about him, someone who loved God, professed the Lord, sought to follow the Lord, and live as a true Jew. So then Nathaniel, coming to this realization after Jesus says, I saw you and I know who you are. Nathaniel immediately declares Jesus as teacher, as the son of God and the king of Israel. So he got it right away. He got it. He understood just from Christ's own words. He spoke right to his heart that this is the one 
he has prophesied about, the one that I've been waiting for and pouring my mind and heart into the word of God, looking for, hoping and anticipation for to come. Nathaniel immediate believes, immediately, and goes to follow Christ. We find interesting in the next passage here that in John 1, 50, he says, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You see, you shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. I find this really unique because what Jesus actually just said were a couple prophecies from the Old Testament. And so after he calls them, he almost affirms to them that I am the one. When Jesus says that the angels of God are ascending and descending, this is a reference to Genesis 28, where Jacob was in the wilderness and in a vision, he saw God and he saw angels and des- angels ascending and descending from heaven on a staircase or a ladder, also known as Jacob's ladder. Uh, and And God was there and he talked to him and affirmed the covenant relationship that Jacob was coming into. And so this prophecy is confirmed to Nathaniel and Philip that I am the one that is prophesied about. And then he says again, here we see the worded worded son of man. Has the word son of man ever struck out to you? Why would Jesus call himself the son of man? It's kind of an interesting phrase to say, right? The wordage son of man is found in the Old Testament in Daniel 7. And it's not something that we focus on a lot in biblical prophecy. But in Daniel 7, it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All people, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So now he uses this wordage in talking to Nathaniel and Philip and is affirming, hey, I am the one that was to come. I'm here right now. And so we find Philip and Nathaniel having this phenomenal calling with Jesus, using prophetic words to tell him, I'm the guy, I'm the Messiah. And so they leave. They leave everything behind and follow him. Where were you when Jesus called you? Where were you? Where were you? When Christ brought salvation to your heart, where were you where God spoke words specifically to you and met you right where you were at? You could probably think of things that come to your mind and your heart where God came to you and spoke out of his heart of love and his heart of tenderness because he is love. And in Christ, he pours his love out into us when we come to him freely. Where were you? So Philip and Nathaniel left. They left everything to follow Christ because they saw a life more worth it in him. They followed the chosen one, the promised king. And Nathaniel acknowledges this, that he was the king of Israel. Over the next three years with Jesus, they followed him in a public ministry where Jesus preached the coming kingdom of God. They followed him through hard teachings to understand where Jesus says, hey, you got to eat my flesh and you got to drink my blood. That's kind of hard to understand. And everybody left him then. Except for the 12 disciples. They saw him turn water into wine. They saw him 
bring in someone who was in, caught in adultery and they saw her be forgiven by Christ. They saw him walk on water. That would be a hard thing to think about too, to see. Say you're just riding in a boat and then you see a guy walking on water coming to you. It's kind of scary. They were scared. The disciples were scared. But they spent the next three years understanding what is the kingdom of God. They went through a time of discipleship by Christ. Recently, we've kicked off the notion of, or kicked off small groups again within our church, a place where you can grow deeper and be discipled in a small group and a fellowship. And I think that is also an image of growing deeper in fellowship with other believers to be discipled by the Lord. In this group, you may have intimate times of fellowship, make memories, have fun, eat food, eat pizza, go bowling, do activities together, ride a bike, go bowling. Did I say that already? I did say that already. Whoops. Watch a movie together or have coffee. Just meet for a coffee time. You may also have life challenges to go through together. Be stretched by Christ to grow in your faith and live it out. To dive deeper in the word and struggle through those times where your heart is weary and worn. But to do it together in an intimate group of fellowship, a support system, just like the disciples had with Christ. Over time, we hope our relationships will grow deeper, that we'll come to understand the kingdom of God that God has brought down here on earth, and we will be changed together. So after these three years, I'm going to jump back to Philip a little bit. After these three years, they're up in the upper room, and they're having communion together. And Jesus tells them what's going to happen and what's to come. We also find some very intimate words that we all have come to know that Jesus said about himself. Thomas says this, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And then Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then we find Philip, who had an amazing beginning after three years of discipleship, still struggling to get it because he says, show us the Father and that will be enough. And then Jesus says, Philip, don't you know me? After all this time, don't you know me? I think in our own lives, we also have times where it's, I just don't know if I get it. I don't know if I get this faith that I'm being called into. I don't know if I get Christ all the time. Or maybe you don't feel close to the Lord all the time. But Christ is still right there. He hasn't left. Christ was still right there in the upper room with Philip. Even as Philip was struggling to understand that he came from the Father. After that, we find they all deserted him. All of the disciples left, and Christ died. Well, he didn't stay there. In three weeks, we're going to celebrate how Christ rose from the dead. I love Holy Week. It's an exciting time. I hope you guys are excited for Easter coming. They rose from the dead. And the calling in their lives never ended. Christ brought the disciples back together and say, hey, I have a mission for you now. The things I said, we're going to do them now. Your calling is not over. It never ended when I died. It's actually just beginning. The next step of your calling is just beginning. And Christ takes us through steps of calling, steps from one place to the next. We just talked about that the other night in, in my, my small group. And I said, before I was here at Faith, 
I worked on a cattle farm, and my job was to haul poop every day. (laughs) That was my job. That was my calling because in those hours of sitting in the truck, God was formulating different things in my heart because that was the next step of my calling. And that might be right where you're at too. God might have you in what seems like a poop truck (laughs) for the next step of your calling, the next place he wants to move you and take you and mold you. We find the 12 apostles, the commission, the great commissioning from Christ to where they're moving into something that they're still following Jesus and they're holding nothing back. You and I have also been commissioned by Christ to follow him and to hold nothing back, to be fully Christian in whatever sphere of life you are in, living the life of Christ as a follower of Christ. Maybe he's called you to be an amazing, godly parent. Maybe he's called you to reach people where you are at work. And maybe you've been called to go overseas. I know some in here are called in December to go to Mexico City to go overseas. But wherever God has you, I encourage you, don't hold back. Don't give up. And know that wherever you are at in life, God loves you. That his calling, the calling in Christ is not primarily first out of do this and I'll love you. No, Christ loves us first. God loves us. And out of that love, he calls us into something much bigger and something so much more. Everything stems from that loving relationship with him. And know this. You can do it. You don't have to be perfect. He's perfecting us. So you don't have to be perfect when you come to the Lord. He will use whatever circumstance you're in to mold you. In Christ's salvation, we are redeemed. Christ redeemed us from the power of sin and death so we could live a new life in him, to him, for him, to find our identity in him. Let us go, you and I together, and as a church, to make disciples of all nations, to lead people to Christ, and to share the gospel of salvation with them. Christ ended his journey with the disciples, at least here on earth, with these words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the very end of the age. Amen.